Hello, and welcome back to Zim Explorer. I'm Dr. Abstract. In this Zim Explorer, we're going to take a look at a multi user app called Patternoids. This is the app that we launched for Zim Zoom. That's when people from around the world get together on Zoom and talk about Zim. Uh, you can catch those at uh, zimjazz.com slash zoom uh, and we'll also post the link to Patternoids uh, in the bottom here of this explore on YouTube. Let's go take a look. So here, here is an example of the app opened up in two different windows. So as we move over here it moves on the right and we can also set the radius and how many of these rings and a scale like so. Ooh, neat, huh? I can't control this one from here. I would have to go over to here. So this is some other avatar who's now controlling this one. We'll do roughly kind of the same thing. Move that one to the center there. So we've got um, we've got two avatars here. If we added another one, let's try it. Open it up again in a browser. This adds these little sticks here. And so now I can uh, add sticks to the mix in a sense. And we've got that happening on all of them. As I delete, so watch, I'm going to close this one. And that means the sticks, wherever the sticks are, there are these, these big things right here. Watch the sticks disappear. Maybe I'll make them a little smaller so you can concentrate on them. Okay, so I close this one down with the sticks, and that one fades away from the other two. And if I close this one down, it will take this big blue ring, and, and she's gone, leaving only the green. Let's close that down too. Here's the code. So we called it Patternoids. I made this with some co-ops, as a matter of fact, and they came up with the name, which was cute. Almost sounds like paranoid. <laughs> They're going to steal it. Oh no, <laughs> paranoids. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, it will be zimjazz.com slash paternoids will be the URL or is the, the current URL for it. We're bringing in create.js and zimcat03. Also pizzazz for the little download button. And we forgot to show you this. I'll open up in browser plus here so it opens up next to it. And uh, this icon right here is a download icon, <laughs> if you want to use it for a download icon. Um, and uh, so that's what we're using the pizzazz for. We're also bringing in Socket.io, which is what this is powered on. So it's powered by ZimSocket. And there's a, a ZimSocket server on a Node.js server. So I'll show you how to hook yourself up to that if you need to, or you can download it all yourself and host it yourself as well. But that would require having a node server, which who knows, maybe you have, maybe you don't. Uh, our server is located here, so if we take this URL right here, it points to, uh, I don't have the browser open, desktop reveal points to just that, that's all. Sort of three locations for our socket server, for our wonder server, and for our distill server. And that means if we ever change the location of these, we can change them in this one file right here. For instance, this already happened to us where these things were on the Amazon cloud, the EC2. And then we took them off there because it was starting to cost us money. And then we moved it to another server. A fellow called Disco hosts a cool server. Uh, so thanks, Disco. All right. And if we ever have to change that, then we can change it in this file. And if you keep this file in your, in your app, then you don't have to worry about it. Because if we change the server URL that works, then your app will still work. Or like I said, you might be hosting it yourself, in which case you would put your own server. Uh, you wouldn't even need this. I will show you where that comes to play in a, 
just a little bit down here. Then we're also bringing in the Zim Socket client. So Zim Socket is a combination of what runs on a server and what runs on a client, which is on the browser. And the neat thing about sockets, well, maybe back up a little bit, you might not know anything about multi-user. Multi-user is a way that we can send information back and forth between anything, any, any browser that is connected to the same socket. So it's how chats are done. Well, maybe how chats are done. You can also do polling chats, but uh, any real-time communication, uh, avatars like like what we're doing here, chats, shared whiteboards, type of thing. It's usually considered the most difficult of of coding. It's very tricky to do because you have to sort of take care of. Oh, well, you're going to see it as we go through it here, and we've done other explorers on on um, sockets as well. However, this was a very concise example so I thought I would do an explore on it. So what we've done with ZimSocket is made it so that you only have to worry about what's on the client side and you don't have to do any server-side coding and that's one really nice thing. Okay so uh, we're bringing in ZimSocket on the client side. Coming down we're in a fit mode here We've made an avatar class, which is what uh, allows us to make these nice patterns right here. It's basically, as, as you can see, it's a bunch of circles at a certain radius. So we can change the radius. When they overlap like that, we're doing a difference mode, so that, or a blend mode. So that's, that's really quite easy to do in Zim, despite the fact that it looks so beautiful and <laughs> complex. <laughs> it's just some circles. Um, the, uh, and so you can have a look at that. This is a Zim, well, it's a JavaScript class called Avatar using ES6 class, and it extends a container. So if you're interested in how to make custom classes uh, with Zim, extending containers, then uh, look no further. This is a good example of that as well. So there it is there and ends. Here are the types of shapes that we can pass into it. And so each person who comes in gets the next shape available. And we also handle the color. And there they are. Okay, this avatar class has a shape property, color property, number property, radius, and then we also change the scale, which is just the scale of the container. But these three, or these four, are custom shapes. So I'm going to collapse this so it doesn't get in the way. Here's where we start in the, on the sockets, and there's a little note here saying that you can go to ZimSocket, right here, zimjs.com slash socket. Let's go there now. <laughs> Sorry, I'm in a bit of a slow mood. <laughs> I was dancing for, I don't know, eight hours straight last night, so um, I feel a bit like Mr. Rogers or something. Let's go there now. We'll take a train. <laughs> choo-choo, here comes the choo-choo. Hopefully that's all right. Oh, I don't have a browser again. All right, desktop reveal, a slight desktop reveal down the side. And paste in. Here's ZimSocket. You can get to ZimSocket by going to Zim and pressing code. Probably the easiest way to get there. In the code, we skip by the template. That's where you would get the template, by the way, to start Zim up if, if you're new to Zim. Uh, there's a bunch of different types of templates, but we're using the simple fit template. Past uh, Zim Shin and the CDN, past the various tools and help, help and tools. We're looking for Zim sockets. So after accessibility here, <laughs> libraries. Here we go. So these are the extra libraries, and there's the socket library. There's a game library, physics, etc. Oh, just thought. Uh, so clicking that gets us to the Zim socket page. Just thought you can also go to the docs right here. Oh, maybe you can't. Oh, that's interesting. You can go to the docs and you can get the socket. That that's this is the socket code, but I don't think there's a link from the docs directly to socket. However, under under the docs, if you go to external here, so the sockets are part of the external library. So we'll press that brings us down to there's a game three socket and pizzazz. 
physics is built right into the rest of the docs. But anyway, there's ZimSocket. So you can find out information about uh, ZimSocket there, including examples and uh, what the parameters are. We're going to be using the server parameter to tell us what server it is. If you do it, well, <laughs> That's not going to go anywhere. If you do it locally, uh, you can use a local host, and then you would have Node.js and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, um, this uh, that the socket URLs that or no, what was the server URLs? Zim server URLs gives us this, so we don't have to worry too much about it. You can also specify an app name, which you'll see the maximum people in the room. We just let as many people as as are there come into the room various methods to do things with their, their sockets, like how to set property, or a property, or properties. We're going to be using that. And how to get various properties. It's also getting latest properties, which helps for like a shared ball or shared cursor, something like that. And a history, which will tell us uh, what some information before we even join the socket. Like, if you have a chat, you usually don't want to just come in and say, all right, hey, what were you guys chatting about? You want a, a bit of a history about what the chat is currently going on. And then various properties. We'll be using the size property to find out how many other people are in the room. And then there's events as well, when the socket's ready. Um, if you change your room and error, data is important. Data is when we receive data from other people. If other people change their avatar, then we'll receive the data. You can find out when other people join, other people leave. We'll be using the other leave event, but we won't, we're going to be doing something different for the other join event. I'll explain why. Then there's various events to deal with time and a disconnect as well, if it closes for some reason. Okay. So let's go back to, I don't know if I'll need a browser open again. <laughs> Maybe. We'll go back. That's all at ZimSocket there. Oh, <laughs> we're going to need a browser. <laughs> all right. I forgot to show you where we can get the app ID or set up the app ID. So here's the ZimSocket site, which is why we came out here in the first place, was to show you the socket site. Um, the nice thing about it is, like I said, it all works on the client. What you do is you set your properties or whoever's, whoever's operating something would set their properties. So whoever's moving their avatar, their X and Y gets set. And then you receive objects of other people's values. So if somebody else sets the properties, this is what you would receive. You would receive their, their ID and then their X and Y. And if you've just arrived, you can get, for instance, everybody's ID and everybody's X and Y, and that way you can put the other avatars in the room. Right, so it seems simple, but my goodness, you wouldn't believe how complicated that was to do on the server side just to make that simple stuff work. Something like, I don't know, 200 or 300 lines of very complicated code. <laughs> and that's good, because that abstracts it. All the, we had to handle all those methods and, and properties uh, that you saw there and events. So we've abstracted all that for you. You don't have to worry about that code. Um, it seems hopefully fairly simple. I mean, there's still a number of steps, the surprising number of steps that you have to do to code this uh, avatar example. And this is a very big, uh, I wouldn't call it a basic avatar example. This is a very common avatar example. It should be able to handle most of the things that you would come up against um, for your sockets. So that's good. Um, there's a request here, right here, this thing, request. So if you click on request, uh, you put in your name and email and a single word for your app name. And that way we don't step on each other's toes. So patternoids is taken. <laughs> no using that. We're using that. All right. And you send that off and it records it in a database and it will tell you if you've already, if you've chosen a word that somebody else is already using. So it's sort of a, a trust thing. If you really need to make sure that you uh, are the only ones using a, a code, then you can host it on your own node server, and in which case we're not sharing these, these um, app names. OK, 
Okay, so that's there. The socket page also has a number of examples that you can see. There's a collective coloring one. There's chat. Chat is not even in Zim. Uh, all the rest are. There's an a simple avatar one there. There's a gallery where you can share. There's a remote control thing, which is kind of cool, which is this one right here, remote control. So as I operating these controls here, it, it operate something over here, like could be up on a television or something. So that's the idea. Multiple people can control what you're what you're looking at. This one was a an e-learning app where multiple people try and rebuild a diagram. And then this one is an example of keeping track of how many people are in a room. So this would be good if, say, you wanted to make a game with four people and you're waiting for at least four people to come. So it's actually a socket for the, the waiting room. And once you have enough, it then sends you into a room on your own, and those four people are playing a game together. So uh, it's kind of a two-step socket process. This one right here, this paragraph, is also multi-user. So if you open up, well, I may as well do it since we're here. So as I scroll down there, look, that's already selected. And now I'm going to select with this color. When we go back and look, well, I can't even tell that we're, we're, we're actually changing. So uh, I think I can do it. As I select here, it is selecting so it's multi-user. You would come in and would get another color. Cool, huh? Alrighty. Uh, so now I'll close our browser. I don't think I'm going to need it again. <laughs> famous, famous last words, huh? All right, and so you can read about that stuff there. That's where you would, um, oh, there's where the docs are. And then we're going to make a socket object right here with an ID. So here we pass in the Zim socket URL that is given to us by that, that code that we imported right here. This one, the Zim socket servers has that variable in it. Or if you're hosting it yourself, you would put your the URL to your own server in there. And then here's the code that we uh, pasted into or, or typed into that uh, request field or form there. So we made a new socket and called it socket. We're going to be getting data, and sometimes it's nice to lay out your data. So here's what the, our data is. We'll be getting an ID, so every every avatar or every client that we call them, every client uh, gets an ID. In our case, the client, each client is an avatar, so we'll call them an avatar ID, I guess. And it's made by ZimSocket, so it'll be something long like that. Here's another one. And then inside that are all the properties that we're going to be sharing back and forth. The X, the Y, the level. Level is uh, the stacking level of the avatar, and that's going to be important because you want the collage to look the same for everybody. So how it works is each time you pick up an avatar, if I pick up my avatar, it will come up to the top. That's a choice. It makes most sense, really, because yeah, as I drag it, I want mine to see, be seen up on top sort of thing. But I also then what happens is it goes up on top on other people's as, as well. So we're keeping track of the level. The shape, which needs to be one of those that the avatar can handle. The color. Uh, we are storing the color as in green or red or orange or whatever, but uh, that that's just a variable that leads to an HTML color that looks something like that for green. Well, it looks exactly like that for green. <laughs> the number of shapes that the avatar has on its ring, the radius of the ring, the scale of the avatar, and then we're also given the ID of the avatar as a property as well. It can just be handy to reference it that way sometimes. So that's, uh, if, you, if we didn't share anything, this is what we would have. We'd be given an ID that has a property of the ID. <laughs> and that's it. And then, you know, usually you're sharing properties, uh, an X and Y position or what have you, or some words that somebody says in a chat. Uh, those would be up to you to add those properties. 
All right, so that's an example of our data, and it's nice to have that around so that we can remember what it looks like. It makes it a little bit easier. When the socket is ready, we receive some data, and that will be all of the data that's in the socket at the moment. But it's not data for our own avatar. It's only the avatars that are there already. As a matter of fact, we never receive our own data. So that was a decision in Zim that we just don't receive our own data. It's kind of a waste if we, we, we should know our own data because <laughs> it's in this current. That, that's the thing. You have to sort of have to think about things. Uh, uh, it's in the app that is running. You know, if I if this is this is my avatar, uh, I can send other people this data, but I don't need that data myself because it's in this app. So it assumes that we're going to keep track of our own data. The only the only time that that doesn't happen is in the latest properties. So uh, if if we're asking for the latest property, it might be our own data, I think. Yeah, I don't even know if we, I don't even think we get a data event then. So probably doesn't really matter too much. OK, so uh, great. We'll get a message saying the socket's ready. Did we? And there it is. Socket connected. Zog blue. So we've got a Zog with blue. Oh, darn. We've got a Zog there. We can put a color. I don't know if you knew that. So you can Zog, and that's just normal to the console. But Zog green, Zog red, Zog pink, Zog blue, etc. We Zog blue that our socket's connected, and that's a good sign. If the socket happens to disconnect and then reconnect, which happens every once in a while, I think we left it overnight and noticed that we had two versions of the stuff here. So when our socket's ready, we're going to be adding our avatar, and we add these sliders as well. I woke up in the morning, came back, and I had two sets of sliders. I went, what the heck happened? So sometime during the night, the socket disconnected and was ready again. So my app ended up with two of those. So to handle that, uh, I mean, probably the best thing is just to, anytime it's ready, create the app. Um, so uh, great. But what we want to do is get rid of any other stuff that was on. Like, so before we create the app, get rid of the old stuff. If there isn't anything there, really, you, you know, usually we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't think there's anything there. For instance, if I put a return here, that means go away, and I refresh here. There's the stage with nothing on it. But if there was all, if if it were already there and the socket was ready again <laughs> because it reconnected, then I'd want to remove all of the old stuff that I made and just start over again. So that's that's what we're doing here. Kind of a very awkward way to begin. <laughs> in the likely, in the unlikely <laughs> case of uh, the socket restarting. <laughs> We're getting rid of our old stuff. So that's fine. I actually have never done that before um, because it, it hadn't it hadn't occurred to me that we might need to until I made this app and left it going overnight. So simple solution. There's a it's a two-part solution. We have to deal with it with events as well, but we'll get to that down below. We're making a new rectangle that's the, the frame's color, which is this dark color and adding it because we're downloading it as well. I don't know if you noticed that, but here we are starting up there. Oh, I haven't saved it. Refresh, starting up. We can press the download button here, and it will save out a PNG. So when that happens, you need to have, you can't rely on the stage color. The stage color it becomes clear as the PNG, and you uh, would need to put a rectangle the same size as the stage, basically, and the color of the stage for that to be seen. So uh, that's why we put a rectangle in there and behind. Here are the colors that we're going to assign as we go through. And we've made an avatars container that we put on the stage there as well for all of our avatars. And then on top of that is the Patternoids label. 
the sliders as well will also come up on top of that. So that's why we have an avatars container so that when we bring the avatar up to the top, it doesn't go over top of our, our logo or our sliders. It's also a good practice to usually put things that are all the same in a container. So if you have a bunch of avatars, put it in an avatars container. If we wanted to, we could have then uh, faded the whole avatar container in or out or moved it or uh, printed it or, you know, whatever. So, uh, uh, or animated in, animated out. All right, so uh, we'll make the other avatars first because we'll then add our avatar as the highest thing on top of that. So we're making the other avatars first. We're going to keep track of them in this object right here. We're looping through the data. Each time we get an ID, this is zim loop through an object literal. We'll get the I, we'll get the uh, the ID or the uh, I guess the property name and the property value. The value happens to be uh, an an object literal of various properties. So what we're going to do is we'll just add the avatar. It's a uh, we'll call this function. We'll pass in the ID, we'll pass in the object literal of properties. So in other words, that's this thing right here. So we're getting an ID each time, but we, oh, uh, let's see, how does this work? We loop through the data each time we're given, yeah, that's right. So each time we're given this and that. Next time we're given this and the data. The reason we're calling a function to do that, it's not, there's not much in the function. This is it right here. There's not much in it, but we're going to need to do that too uh, later. So these are all the avatars that are in the room to start. Uh, so there's only one room, so there, these are all the avatars that are <laughs> around at the beginning. Uh, but if somebody else comes later on, after, after we've arrived, if somebody else comes in, we're going to have to add their avatar. And it's the same thing. So we're needing to do this in two places, once at the beginning and once, or well, and then any time when somebody comes in. So we've got an add avatar function. That way we can have the code once, but do it in various places. So maybe just before we take a look at this code, there was another thing that we needed to do here, after, like we're adding each avatar. One of the properties of an avatar is its level. But we can't, we can't set the level before all the avatars are there. For instance, if an avatar came in at level 5, and it's the first avatar, then, uh, well, I was going to say, we, 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 I was just thinking we could possibly sort the data by the avatar number, or by the level number. But anyway, that, that's trickier to do. So what we've done is we've added them all. Well, if, if we... Uh, if the, the avatar came in at level 5, and it's the first avatar that came in, if we tried to put it at level 5 in avatars, there's no other avatars in avatars. It would just go to level 0, and that, that would be that. It, it would say, oh, sorry, you know, you're trying to put it at level 5, but you can't do that. It's at level 0 now. The next one comes in. If it was level 4, it'd do the same thing, etc. So we can't, uh, we can't set the level on these avatars until all the avatars are there. So we just go ahead and add them. Basically, these avatars are, are just getting centered into the avatars folder here each time we add them. They just get added, and then we loop through the data again, get the same stuff, and we say, well, the avatar we just made, <laughs> this is going to be the avatar we just made, the avatar we just made set its level to whatever is in the properties at that level. Okay, so it's sort of a two-step process. Add them all, and then set their levels. So you'll probably have to do that if you set the levels as well. All right, what's in this, what's in this function right here? We receive the ID and the properties. We're storing in the others object right here, in this empty object. We're storing at the ID that we get a, an actual physical avatar. Well, as physical as it gets, I suppose. This thing right here. <clears throat> That's a Zim container, right? Well, it's an avatar, but that extends a container. And we passed in the various properties that we need to make that. So it's shape. So whatever 
we've whatever has been recorded in the socket as as the shape of this avatar at that ID. That's what we're using. The color of that avatar at the ID. The the number of shapes and the radius of the ring. Number of shapes in a ring. So there's the radius going bigger and smaller. Bigger, smaller radius. And here's the number, which could be zero. It's also the scale. And we, we deal with that after. So that's what's that's what makes our avatar. Then we're making sure that the registration point is centered. That was just a decision to center reg. It helps when we're changing the radius that the registration points in the center. We're locating it at the X and the Y that has recorded, and we're setting the scale to the scale that's recorded. Then we're fading it in. This is a bit of extra. Watch as it comes in. This is our avatar. It didn't fade in. <laughs> Anybody else's avatars would, uh, would fade in. So we would see ours here, and then we would fade in the other avatars. Um, it doesn't really take much to add that little bit there. And that fades it in, makes it look a little bit more professional. We do that when they leave as well. We fade it out. So that's the function that will add other people's avatars. We're going to now do some uh, capture some events. So we're capture the data event that tells us when somebody's changed their avatar. And there's also an other leave event that says when somebody leaves, we have to remove the avatars. We skipped over this couple of lines. What, th what these do is if these events, these events right here are stored in socket.data, that's just because uh, we want to test to find out if they're already there. And so if it calls the ready event again, which is right here, if we just stored them in local variables, when it calls a ready event again, the next ready event, it's not supposed to, remember? <laughs> like It's only supposed to call the ready, ready event once, but this is one of the things why, why we did the dispose all children, just in case the ready event gets called again if the socket reconnects. Um, if we stored this as a local variable in here, like const colors, uh, we wouldn't have access to that anymore. So we wouldn't be able to turn off the previous events. And those previous events would still be triggering. So uh, probably, I think they would be, or they might be anyway. But we want to, it's always a good, good procedure to um, clear any old events. Don't just overwrite something, because events hang around. They, they cause memory leak if you do that. So what we've done is we've stored the event on the socket which doesn't change. Even though the socket may reload, it's still the same socket object. So uh, what this is doing is saying, if there's already a data event on the socket, this is nothing special. That's just our own custom property name that we've given it. Could have been my data, my leave. It's not, it's not a, a property of the socket normally. We've added it to it. Okay, if, if, if we've already done this assignment, then turn that off, and this will clear the event, socket.off, take away that data event, and there's the ID that we need to use to turn it off. So we do that with both the data and the leave. That's probably a little bit confusing for you, but if you've done events, then it's still minorly confusing, but at least a little bit better. So we make sure we clear the events before we add any new events. And here we are adding the new events. So socket.data, when we uh, receive some data, this is from other people moving or changing any of their properties. We receive that data. The data is going to have an ID. So it will have the ID of who made the changes. So that means the other person uh, that's making those changes would be in our others object and we can find out which one. Because remember, whenever we add others, we are adding it based on their ID. So basically, this will give us access to that other, whoever changed their avatar's avatar in our app. The only thing is, bum bum bum, 
maybe this doesn't exist. Because what if it were a person who's changing their data, but they came in after we came in? So right at the moment, we only have, in, in the others, we only have the people who were there when we arrived. So these are all the people that when we arrived. Nowhere have we added anybody who comes in after us to the others uh, object, date object. So this is our opportunity to do that. It's not a bad thing. So we basically say, hey, okay, if there is somebody else there already, that means we already have them in our others, then go ahead and change your data. Come back to that. Else, it's time to add an avatar. <laughs> Neat, huh? So who are they? What's their ID? Because if we couldn't find their ID in our others, then we say, okay, well, if we don't have it, then we'll add the avatar based on that ID and based on the data that they're sending. Cool, huh? As long as the data, the very first time that they, they arrive, that the data is full. And I think you'll see down below here, this is what I mean by lots of steps in here. When we go to make our avatar, this is what it looks like. We're going to tell the socket, hey, we have an avatar. And we set these properties right here. And uh, um, those get sent off to the socket. So basically, all of our properties are going to come in to here, right, on other people. So other, other people will have this code. And when we add our avatar, they're going to say, oh, wait a minute. We haven't, you know, we were here first. We haven't seen this, this new person that's come in. Therefore, we're going to make an avatar based on the idea, based on the data that they sent. All right. If, um, if the avatar is already in our list, then we say, okay, so yeah, if it's already here, then we're going to loop through the data that they've sent. It may not be all the data, but it could be an X and Y property, for instance. We're going to loop through that and find out what the property name of it is, find out the value of it. These, these get given to us by ZimSocket as we're looping through. Well, actually, the data gets given to us, and we're looping through that data. This gets given to us by zip loop right here. And we say, OK, the other at that property, x, for instance, is equal to the value, whatever value is coming through, 300. Or if it's just the scale, that's going to the other at scale. So this is the dynamic targeting way of saying, so if it were scale coming in, it would be other.scale. If it were x coming in, it would be other.x. So these two things are the same. Why well, Adam just does triple x? For, like if you put in an x, it's like, what the heck, Adam? You know? uh, what does triple x give us? Um, I'm a superhero or whatever that guy is. Xander Cage. <laughs> other dot, and I'll do it with scale. Avoid that problem. Scales. Other is the same as other at quote scale. Okay, equals 10. Hopefully it's not 10 times bigger. Maybe it goes up to 10. I'm not sure. Okay, those two things are the same. We can do the dot syntax for a property, or we can do at a quote. And indeed, the properties that are coming out are going to be quotes. Hey, this is the x property, this is the y property, etc. So up here, well, we won't exactly see it. But when we send in properties here, you can't tell if those are quotes or not. But when we're receiving it from the socket as data, they are, it comes in as quotes. You can do that, by the way. And like It doesn't matter if you, you can put quotes around that if you want. Uh, but you don't have to in a JavaScript object like this. Mm, where were we down here? We don't want to do these guys. Okay, so that's us looping through and setting any property that we're receiving because uh, somebody else told us that they've changed something. I hate when that happens. It's called, um, if I make one move like that and I try and not undo it, undoing is fine, but try and do it with backspaces, it it's, takes more effort to kind of get rid of what I've, what I've changed, imbalanced. All right, anyway. Blah, bitty, blah. Explore, explore, explore. Anytime I go on a tangent, I should probably do something like, uh, I don't know, start the explore music or something.
I explore, explore, explore. Nah, I better not do that because you'll probably think, oh, the explore is finally over. <laughs> is that what you're thinking? Finally, the explorer is over. Here is uh, when somebody leaves. Uh, when they leave, uh, we're given data. Uh, we actually give all of the properties of that avatar person or client or whatever that leaves. But we really only need to know the ID of that. So we ask for its ID and we go to our others list, find it, set our other. And then as long as we're just making sure we've got something there, uh, presumably we will have, but sometimes it doesn't hurt to, tap, to check. Then we're going to animate the alpha to zero in a certain amount of time. And when we're done, we dispose it completely. So that will take away all those shapes and the avatar will be disposed. Then we need to delete it from our others list. So delete the others at the data ID is how you can remove something from an object literal. You use the delete command. So that's when somebody leaves the socket. So this handles all the others. When the others give us data, adding the others. Okay. And now it's time to do our own avatar. We're going to make our avatar start within a certain margin, so 200 from any of the edges. We'll pick a shape. So the shape comes from however many people are in the socket and the shapes dot length, and we're, we're using the modulus there. So that gives us the remainder. Uh, the first time, if, if there's zero people, then it's going to be uh, zero divided by the length. Uh, let's see, how does that work? socket size. Um, yeah, so it'll be zero. Then if there's one person, it'll be one, two, three, etc. But as soon as you get to more than the length of the avatar shapes, then it will wrap. So what that does is wraps. It says, okay, hey, there's five avatars and we've got a socket size of five. Five percent five is like five divided by five. The remainder is zero. So this goes back to zero and it picks the first shape. When it's six, when we have six people, and the, the length of the, the um, array of shapes is 5, then we've got 6 divided by 5, which has a remainder of 1. So this becomes 1, then 2, then 3, then 4, then 1, then 2, then, or no, sorry, then 0, then 1, then 2, then 3, 4, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. It keeps on repeating. A little bit of JavaScript trickery. Well, not JavaScript trickery, just uh, math trickery with the modules. We do the same thing with colors. Colors has a different number so that as we as we repeat, we're actually getting different color circles will come in at some point if we had more than five. So we get a shape and a color. This is our own avatar. We make our own avatar with the shape and color. It will take the default for the uh, number of uh, shapes around the ring and the ring radius. So we didn't bother passing in any of those. We make sure to center regit on avatar. And we're locating it somewhere randomly within that margin. That's what that's doing, randomly within the margin. And then we're setting it to drag so that all of it drags, not just if we didn't put the all true in there, it would then drag any of the, the various circles like that, which is not what we want. But that can be handy in many cases. If we have 100 monsters or any container we put a drag on, it will drag the pieces or the parts of the container, the children of the container, unless we say all, drag all of them, please, at which point it will drag all of them. Okay. Here's where we set our socket properties. So there they all are. That's all the information that we need to set. That will go off to ZimSocket. We already have a socket ID. The socket ID happens as soon as we make a socket and it connects and it's ready. So at that point, we have a socket ID. We don't have to know about what our socket ID is. Um, we never have to care. But as soon as we send something off here, that socket ID gets sent off to all of the people who are already in the socket. 
when it does if they uh, they won't know who we are so it will call this right here so uh, the data will come in but it will look at this and say oh I haven't I don't have another it, there won't be this will be undefined there won't be any other in in their others object right here so therefore they will call the av add avatar and they'll add all of that data that we just did and the ID to the other thing and then they'll be good to go then it will be there so anytime we make a change after that it will be there there is an, an uh, we did an others leave there is an others join but the others join triggers at this time right here when our socket is ready they'll all receive that I've joined and at the moment I haven't made or we haven't made the the avatar so we can't tell them the avatar data at this moment we could I suppose if we wanted to make the avatar before we do the socket ready we could have made the avatar up here it's just a little bit awkward so we didn't do it that way if we make the avatar up here well actually it would have to be up here before we even call the socket so we make the avatar here we could then pass in data as we make the socket we can pass in data therefore zim socket could pass that data back to everybody else when they receive the other join and then they would receive all of the data from the socket that we made but we didn't do it that way like i said it's a little bit little bit awkward we'd have to make the socket up here we wouldn't want to add the socket until after all the other people's sockets get added etc 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 so um or all the other avatars got added so we didn't bother doing it that way it was just um, one extra step here saying oh we're going to receive some data well if we already know them set their data if we don't then add the avatar so this takes the place of the other join all right and that's how i usually do it so we set our note this is set properties on the socket for multiple properties when we do multiple properties it's quite easy it's a it's an object literal with all of the properties that we want to set when we mouse down on our avatar we're going to be setting a different level that will bring as soon as we mouse down it brings it up a level so even if we don't drag see there's a press move but if we don't drag we still are bringing it up a level when we mouse down so we need to send the level when we mouse down we don't really need to send x and y until we actually move the thing so when we want to set one property we can just call set property we pass it the string name of the property and the value so in the socket all the property names are stored as strings when we oh and that's another thing too actually the the values of things that are stored in a socket also need to be just the sort of the primitive strings numbers uh, I think we can handle boolean but you know sort of anything that you would save in a JSON file for instance okay you can't actually save the whole avatar in a socket you kind of can you can use zimon it's called to do that but uh, you know I don't think you need to do that zimon uh, turns a zim object into like a json type object and we'll recreate that for you when it comes back it's pretty amazing anyway uh there we are saving the level of the avatar with set property and when we press move so as i press down and move here i'm constantly sending the x and y of the avatar using set properties that then will come into other people's data right here it will come in as other people's data we'll say oh yeah i know that guy i know that avatar and it will loop through the x and y get x and y x and then y and assign the new values and that's how it updates with the stage.update somebody else is moving this is what's this is what's happening now that's a lot of data actually because a press move happens very quickly and we seem to handle it we had 10 people in or something like that seem to handle it just fine um, but if you wanted to you could use a 
motion controller. So everywhere you click here, everywhere you tap on a mobile or click in a computer, it would then move to there. And what you're doing then is only the motion controller does. That's default motion controller. Press and it will move to wherever you press. Press and it moves. What you're doing there is only passing one bit of data, the X and Y, at one time. That's it. Not, not constantly as we drag like that. So that's actually a more efficient way if you're worried about performance and stuff like that. If you've got a bunch of people, 100 people moving around in a place, don't give them drag capability. Allow them to press. That's just one bit of data. And then each client will be responsible for animating that object to that location, which is no problem. It's, it's, basi it's basically as easy as this. We just say animate to that. Well, it would be in the data. When the data comes in, it wouldn't be constant. It would be, well, you could move it there, but you, you wouldn't see it animate to there. It would just like, boom, up here, boom, up here, boom, up here. You could do that if you wanted to, but uh, what would be best is to, oh, yeah, receive some data, animate it to there, and that would probably do you well. The controls are down here. We're styling them to get these little round things. Uh, we're putting them in a container so that we can easily remove them and add them. We're doing that because when we download here a picture, we want to remove the controls, download or save it, and then add the controls again. It happens so quickly you can't see it. So isn't that cool? So we make a controls container. Also, we then could have animated in our controls if we wanted to, etc. We have a slider. And the slider is setting our avatar, avatar is our avatar's number property, to whatever the slider's current value is. That's the number slider. That's this one. Okay, the number of things on there. It sets our property. But it also sends off to the socket. It sets a property number on the socket for our current value. And remember, when we set a property on the socket, our ID automatically gets sent along with it. We don't have to worry about that. Other people then receive that ID and say, oh, I know that person, and uh, make the changes. So that's back up here again. Oh, I know that person. Make the changes. This would be just the number. Put the number in here. Change it to the value. Neat, huh? Same thing with the radius. We set our radius, and we set it off to the other people. Same thing with the scale. We set our scale, and we send the scale off to the other people. Here's the loader. This is just plain Zim, where we make a loader. Uh, we've got that pizzazz icon. When we tap on the icon, we remove the controls. We save the, uh, the whole stage, because now we've removed the controls. The stage also includes, we wanted to get the patternoids in there, and we saved. And it saves that to the computer. And then we add the controls again. Move the style, and that's it. Oh, not quite it. If there's an error, this is what it looks like. If the socket can't connect, then it looks like this. Look quickly, because we're it's gonna as soon as the socket connects, it would take away the error message. Sorry, it could not connect. Ah, but actually it did connect. So when it connected, it removed all, everything from the stage, including <laughs> that that error message. Well, there you go. The socket can't connect. And we're done. And I tell you. Anybody who's done Mike multi-user before, <laughs> anybody whose name is Mike, anybody who's done multi-user before, uh, this is pretty easy going. Okay, um, so I hope you enjoy it. This has been a Zoom Explore, and I am Dr. Abstract. So, uh, you know, uh, you're welcome to uh, go through that Explore again. Uh, I... It was fun. We, we had a good time at the Zim Zoom. I will hope you come into the next Zim Zoom. If you're listening to this, follow us at zimjs.com slash slack or actually come in and join us at zimjs.com slash slack. Follow us on Twitter. <laughs> follow us on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook. Uh, we also have a Discord channel, zimjs.com slash discord. We'd love to talk to you about anything and we need to see what you make with multi-user. I'm Dr. Abstract. Have a good day.